All right, guys, we are live for another live stream, although we haven't done one in a long time. So, um, yeah, welcome. Welcome to a Saturday live stream. So uh, what are we doing today? Um, first of all, let me know how the audio levels are and uh, that the video is okay. Um, again, this is a one-man show, uh, at least for now. I'm going to try and get some, some guests on. I think I'm going to have DMS on at some point and then also... Um, at some point down the line, I think Golden is going to join. At least he's uh, he said that he's down for that. So I just need to I need to find a time uh, to do that uh, because of course these are on this is on the weekend, and I don't want to you know bug folks on the weekend um, unnecessarily. Regardless, um, as usual, uh, if you guys are looking for uh, sorry, today we're going to do the Theo Audio Oracle Mark II and Meze 109 Pro. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, if you guys are looking for the measurements of these, they have already been posted up on the uh, headphone community forum. Uh, there's a link in, in the description to that, um, along with sort of an official discussion thread there uh, for those who are coming at this afterwards. Um, and uh, as usual, if you guys are looking for more of the uh, full written articles, those are up on headphones.com in the links in the description as well. So make sure you guys are stay tuned to that. Um, but uh, for today, I figure what we'll do is the usual kind of stuff that we do with the live reviews. So I will do a live review of the Theo Audio Oracle Mark II, it's right here. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Meze 109 Pro because I've spent a little bit more time with it. I've actually di uh, dialed in the EQ for this one a little bit more. Um, and then uh, I will, and then we'll just kind of open it up to regular Q and A. So for your guys's spicy questions, spicy hour will happen after we'll talk about these two uh, these two products, all right? So hold those until a little bit later. Um, I see you guys are already asking about the Expanse. Ask me that after we'll talk about this, all right? Um, because yes, I have already measured that one as well. Um, but regardless, uh, let's dive into the The Audio Oracle Mark II. And once again, let me know if the, uh, you, you're saying I'm lagging? All right, let's make sure I'm not lagging. Uh, let's um yeah there's always <laughs> there's always technical issues uh it's youtube is telling me the stream is good so just the camera's too close all right let's move that back <laughs> you don't want me like right in your face <laughs> the, the most intimate face stage <laughs> all right Okay, we're not lagging. Good. Okay, it's just uh, somebody's internet. Sorry for that. Um, but okay, let's dive into it. So, uh, The Audio Oracle Mark II. So, I, I usually have the box and everything, uh, but for this one, it was actually, it's a kind of a larger box, and I just didn't, I didn't have space to put it in my backpack. So, I just went with the, the case here. Uh, this is the new style of um, The Audio's cases, and I, I like it. I also kind of liked, they had this older style where it was sort of like a brown, thinner kind of leather case. And I kind of prefer that case because it was smaller and you could actually fit it into a pocket. Uh, but of course, this one is, the nice thing about this one is that it, it can accommodate all the different tips, which you do get a number of them in here. Um, but then, uh, let me just, which, yeah, I mean, all IEMs basically come with a bunch of different tips, um, including some foam ones. The audios are kind of like, they're kind of like this. They have like the different colors. Um, to denote the the size, um, the yellows are medium. But uh, I prefer to use the silicon ones um, that come with them as well. I do have Shaw Internet. <laughs> oh, now it is lagging. Okay, all right. Okay. Hmm. Well, everything says it's okay on my end, so. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna just assume it's fine. It, YouTube has, it has now lagged for me as well, so. <laughs> okay, regardless, let's, let's keep going here, and I'm gonna rely on you guys here for this. This is a joint effort. Alright. So this is what they look like. Now, I do have the originals here as well, and I'm just going to hold them up to compare. Right? So, so this is the original. This is These are the new ones, uh, the Mark IIs, OG Mark II. Um, 
come on, there we go. And uh, I gotta say, the look of it, I, I prefer the look on the new ones, even though I really like the originals. This is just like gonna be a personal preference thing. But um, yeah, there's something about this new design that I I really like for the faceplate. Um, as far as size and comfort, they're very similar, but yeah, I it wouldn't surprise me if they're using the same shell. Um, it has the same nubbin on the back here. Um, so if you found the original to be uncomfortable, you'll probably find this one to be uncomfortable. I didn't find either to be uncomfortable, so I assume this is just the same uh, body shell. It's If it's not, it's close enough. Um, and uh, for the cable, uh, this cable is actually really nice. Uh, at least I find it to be nice. I mean, people have different opinions on what's nice in a cable, but it, it doesn't keep its shape all that much. It's it's very like, you know, pliable, and it's not like huge and unwieldy and heavy and uncomfortable. So um, and for usability, it's totally fine. Uh, there's a cool thing though about these cables, and it's that, oh uh, well, maybe not. If I can if I can figure this out here. There we go. So they have this modular cable system. And this one is a little different from the other modular cable system that they had, where they had like a 2.5 that you could then put different um, you know, terminations on. This has like the terminations actually separate. And the nice thing about this is it means that um, there's not as much bulk added to the termination end. So that's cool. Um, and then, yeah, like there's a, it's kind of like a four pin system that you have to line up. And then you can you, you can throw on like 2.5 or you know pentagon or whatever you want um so um for all of the non-sound related stuff i find these to be excellent they are very comfortable they're not the most comfortable for me but they are definitely comfortable enough and i like the new look i suppose um so that's basically it for that uh now let's dive into the frequency response um one second if i can figure that out Boom. All right. <laughs> okay. Is the cable chunky? No, it's it's I mean it's it's not a small cable. It's not thin, but it is it is not overly heavy. So I really like the cable. Um and you do get a chin cinch thing on it as well. I believe. Let me double check. Yes. Yes, you do. Um now, let's dive into the measurements here as you can see on the screen. I hope some, <laughs> love you some squiggly lines, as do I. So this one is a little bit brighter than the original Oracle. Uh, that's basically the way I think about this. I would consider the original Oracle to be very similar to a neutral or even tonal balance. Um, it's been my neutral reference point um, as of late, or one of my neutral reference points. It, like if I'm thinking about a go-to IM that I would consider to be neutral, the Oracle is high on that list. Let's just put it that way the original and the new one is just brighter like basically from everything from you know 3k onwards is basically a bit brighter so here you can see it uh, against the original oracle which is the dotted line here um and uh yeah i mean there's a couple of differences in different places i would describe the new oracle like the oracle mark ii as being slightly more Harmon-esque um, in the sense that it has a stronger pronouncement towards the sub bass uh, and it has uh, yeah more ear gain uh, up top considerably more um, this is not quite on the spice level as like the um, IE 600 I know a lot of people love that one but I mean there's no denying that that is a brighter uh, has a bright trouble presentation and for this one I don't find it to be sibilant I, I just find the whole range to be a little bit brighter um, and just for comparison uh, here is Harman IE 2019 but there are like this is the, this is the thing about Harman IE 2019 it, the data might be what the data is right but in practice nobody actually likes this <laughs> like, so at a certain point we got to just sort of like you know recognize that you know there's either issues with you know maybe the starting point for 2019 for the Harman IE target or or something there's a, there's a, there's a problem there because nobody likes it and actually I think we can prove that uh soon with one of Crin's new collabs uh that I'm excited about but um yeah I I this one leans a little bit closer to Harman than it does um some of the other 
you know, let's say, quote unquote, good tunings. All right. So um, I think you can see generally relative to the original Oracle, uh, the Mark II is also very similar, but just brighter. And I'm going to say that there is a sense in which the new one kind of lifts the veil a little bit on certain recordings. Like there's an extra sense of crispness and clarity to the whole thing. Um, and yeah, um, I think it's done in a very tasteful and good way because it's not like there's any particularly sharp or fatiguing element that comes through. There's no major peak or piercing moment in the treble that kind of dominates over the rest of the harmonics. And so because of that, it's more just a, a, a you know, high shelf kind of thing, right? That's, that's how I would describe it, you know, basically from 4K onwards. Um, you get a little bit more ear gain in, at around 3K, and that's actually one of the things I really appreciate about the The Audio IEMs is that they have a little bit less ear gain than the Moondrop ones. I find the Moondrop ones to be shouty generally, even though I respect that they have a good tuning, like the variations. Uh, it's unbelievably technical and the tuning is fantastic, but it is shouty for me and people who have ear canals like mine. And in this one, for the, the Oracle Mark II, there's a little bit more ear gain there in that region, but it is because the treble, it's all about relative balance here, guys. Because the treble above it is shelved upwards a little bit, that balance between fundamental and harmonic, or I guess the balance between harmonics here um, for the upper mids and treble is intact. It's actually quite good. Um, just, yeah, a little bit crisper. And the way I'm going to describe this is better for certain genres like jazz and acoustic and classical. You know, I would probably gravitate to the Mark II. Uh, for more aggressive genres like metal and rock and that kind of stuff, I would definitely gravitate more towards the Mark I. And that's because uh, that extra sense of treble crispness can lead to a bit of, um, I don't know, like, fatigue fatigue is not the right word because again it's not sibilant so much as it is just an extra kind of like shrillness for those genres but totally desirable on those other genres that i mentioned okay let's move on um i want to show re relative to a couple of other iems here uh because i think people want to know uh, that's the kato you guys oh, okay let's let's do kato from moondrop let me just actually make sure this is aligned where is it? There it is. I have a whole bunch of IEM measurements here, and that's why this is... <laughs> I've done it this way. Um, <clears throat> okay. So you can see, actually, that the ear gain level is about the same between the Kato and the Oracle Mark II. However, you know where I found the Kato to be shouty, I don't find the Oracle Mark II to be shouty because... The treble balance, there's just so much more of it in, you know, so the relationship between upper mids and lower treble, you know, makes it so that it is not shouty, right? The, the, the rest of those harmonic, like there's this, these upper mid harmonics are not boosted over the treble ones, which is what I find to be the case on most of the Moondrop IEMs for, for me, right? Um, even though, yeah, they're generally great. Let's look at the, um, let's look at the timeless. Because people always want to know about that. So the timeless, I mean, it depends on where you normalize this, right? Um, the timeless is a bit more of that sort of like upper bass, lower mid range presence. Um, and then the treble is a little bit different. Yeah. It's a little brighter on the Oracle Mark II, but you know, it doesn't have this sort of more fatiguing kind of piercing mid treble, 9k, 8k, 8, 9k region. Right. Um, I, I think there's probably more of the more energy, you know, between six and 8k than there is between eight and 10k, uh, based on where the damping is for the RAO 402 coupler. But okay, that's the timeless. Uh, to describe the the difference, I I find the Oracle Mark II to be more neutral than the timeless, um, generally. Uh, but the timeless also has its strengths in the technical technicalities department. It's just that it's a little bit fatiguing as a result of that peak, or some. It's somewhere in the trouble. It'll be different depending on the person, right? Um, so yeah, I also hear that as a bit sibilant on the on the timeless. Um, let's see, Monarch Mark II. And this one's interesting, right? Because I I think like the things to nitpick on the Monarch Mark II is that, you know, in the treble, there's a couple of issues, right? Um, but uh, the same, you know, trend of the Oracle Mark II just being brighter continues here. Uh, there's, there's a more emphasis towards all of the treble, not in a way that is fatiguing, just more treble, right? So I would describe it as closer to neutral bright done well. Um, and then t let's take a look at if there anything else. Oh yeah, 
Dunu SA6 is the one I wanted to also compare. And this, these are very different, right? Um, and they're around the same price. My preference leans towards the SA6. Um, it is that more laid back, warm, relaxed. I mean, you know, your upper mids are much more chilled out on the SA6. And that's, it's a good fit for my ear canal. Um, the only thing is that I, you know, the SA6 lacks a bit of air, right? And the, the Oracle Mark II certainly does not. So this is different strokes for different folks. If you want a brighter, you know, uh, sounding IEM, neutral bright Oracle Mark II. If you want a warmer, more relaxed kind of sound, um, SA6. And for me, yeah, I would probably pick the SA6. Um, and maybe last one, I'll do the OG Monarch. It's worth seeing that. These are fairly close, uh, I would say. This, it's interesting to see this difference here, right? Like in the, at around the 2K region. And um, maybe some people will find that the Oracle Mark II has a better sense of space, right, uh, as a result. But, um, yeah, still a little bit brighter as well. Okay, that's the squiggly lines. Praise be. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's go back. Um, now, for, here's the thing, right? Let me just hold these up. The only real knock that I had against the original Oracle was that the variations was more technical, right? I think without a doubt. Unfortunately, I don't have a measurement of the variations here right now. Um, I need to get another one in and run that through the studio. Um, but yeah, um, I think without a doubt, uh, the variations is more technical than this one as well, than the Mark II as well. And really, uh, again, we're talking about uh, a tribrid setup here of single dynamic, two BAs, and two e stats i believe for the treble um now uh, this is one where again i am going to agree with crin that the e stats are not great at least not in you know these implementations i think they are in other implementations but in these ones i find that the technical qualities in the treble are just just not as good as you know they could be um and so the technical performance level that I found on the original Oracle, I find it to be the same, uh, very, very similar um, on, the, on the Mark II. Um, so there is a sense in which the upper treble lift or mid and upper treble lift uh, on the Mark II gives an extra sense of clarity. It lifts the veil. It gives you an extra sense of quote unquote resolution. It is not more technical or more detailed than the original, I find. Which is fine. Um, that's not to say that it's bad. It is generally good, generally solid, just not on the level of the variations. That's, you know, the next level there. The advantage of the of the Oracle, both the Mark I and the Mark II, is that it's not shouty. These are both more smooth sounding, even though this is brighter. The, it doesn't have that lower, lower treble or like upper mid kind of like harmonic boost over the rest of the treble that you know, I find shouty on the variations in a lot of those other Moondrop IEMs. So, um, for me, if I'm not EQing things, this is still over the variations. If I am EQing things, uh, which is the reality, yeah, the variations still wins. Um, and I think, again, out of all of these around this price, I still go to the SA6. It's more my kind of thing. It is a little bit more relaxed, warmer, laid back. Um, yeah, basically that's it. Oh, with the bass. Did I talk about the bass? Okay, the bass... <laughs> <laughs> on the Oracle Mark II, again, it's the same as the Mark I um, for, for that. It is not, I don't find it to be more impactful. I don't find it to be less impactful. And that is to say, generally, it's solid. This is, a you know, it's punchy. It feels good. Uh, but also, it is nothing. It's not like one of those Empire Ears, you know, crazy bass uh, IEMs. So um, if you're looking for crazy bass, I again, based on the relative balance, I probably would go somewhere else. Um that's not what these are about. These are more about that sort of like neutral flavor, which, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy. Neutral bright, I would call it. Um, yeah, okay. So that's the um, the Oracle Mark II. Um, now, let me dive into, uh, again, let me know if, is this, if the stream is okay, guys. <laughs> um, you're asking, Chef Steve, you're asking me to compare a headphone to versus an IEM on the graph? Why? <laughs> Okay, now we're talking about... No, no, now we're going to talk about the 109s. I was talking about the Oracle Mark II as being uh, neutral bright. Uh, for the um, Meze 109s, uh, let me just actually... Well, I have the frequency response graph. I'll show it. I'll pull it up in a second. But we've we've already done a deep a deep dive or a 
<laughs> shallow dive on the Meze 109 Pro's uh, measurements. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of go through a little bit more just of my uh, impressions on this, what I think about this, where this fits in the market, because I didn't really do that in that video. Uh, that was that was more just about the measurements. So um, Meze, they tend to go for this kind of like warm, bright um, sound signature where there's a downward slope and then an upper treble lift. Um, now, the advantage of that, I guess you'd see it this way. The advantage of that is that where the more fatiguing elements of the treble uh, ordinarily is, if it's boosted, um, yeah, that's usually somewhere between 5K and 9K, 5K and 10K. And with the Mezes, uh, they can get away with a lot uh, because the lift on the Mezes is that it's it's usually in you know above 10k um so this is this extra airy kind of shimmery presentation that is it means it's 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 bright but it's it's not fatiguing right it's it's kind of like I, I think dms mentioned that it's, this is like a better a better implementation of the kind of warm bright thing that some of the bear dynamics go for not to the same level of you know insane trouble um you know where you know, it's it's the boost is in the area that's not quite as fatiguing. Um, so on the 109s, you 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 do still have that kind of like mid bass, upper bass uh, bump, uh, subtly, and then there's a 2k recession, which is similar to um, similar to like a HD 800, but I mean it's a, it's actually more than an HD 800, right? So around 2K, there's a recession. It's more similar actually to some of the hi-fi man headphones in that sense. And then you have you have some of that treble, you know, upper treble lift. But there is ear gain there. It does, you know, the, the, the upper mids, like 3K is, you know, very strong. It's at an appropriate level. Um, so overall, the tuning on this one, I would describe as a generally... Uh, generally balanced with a hint of character in a couple of places, right? A little bit of fun or joyousness as, uh, as Antonio Meze called them. But that's all stuff that I mentioned in the, uh, in that previous video on this headphone. Um, so let's get into a little bit more here and talk a little bit about some of the technical performance that I've, you know, cause I'm now compared it against a couple of other things. Uh, if you are looking specifically for value for money when it comes to sound quality, this is not it. All right, so this is not the most technical at this price point. Um, that's not the reason why I think you should buy this one. In fact, I don't care if you buy this one. I don't care if you buy anything. Uh, the point is more that relative to the competition, this is not the the va you know value for money when it comes to sound quality king. Uh, the way that something like a Sundara might be or an HD six hundred might be right. Um, at this price, you're also getting closer to like the Clear and the Alex. Some of those. Um, there's also the Ananda and the Edition XS, and I, th I would suggest that you know those ones around this price are more technical. In fact, there's an argument that even the Sundara is more technical in the sense of instrument separation. Um, you know, uh, this is again depending on. Well, just hear me out on this. With the HD 600, depending on like you compare the HD 600 and 650s with tube amplifiers and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? With these ones, you can't really do that because the sen the sensitivity is too high and the impedance is too low. Um, so this is more, more meant to be driven off of you know a wide range of stuff. Actually, let me just double check exactly what the impedance is here. Um, Meze 109 Pro specs. I believe it's low because they they want their stuff to be driven from a wide variety of devices. And I actually think that that's my biggest gripe with the 109 Pro. I not to say that you would necessarily get extra performance by having a uh, you know higher impedance lower sensitivity uh, headphone. That's not like that's not quite how that works. Um, but I would love it if the sensitivity were lower and the impedance were higher so that I could run it off of more equipment. I could pair it with more, you know, tube amps um, like even just off the Kenzie here, there's quite a bit of noise, so I just wouldn't do that. Yeah, impedance is 40 ohms and sensitivity is 112 dB. SP. Wow. Okay, that's that's uh, with oh, that's a weird way of writing that. But yeah, I guess all manufacturers have weird ways of writing that. Um, so yeah, um, 
it's it's a particularly sensitive headphone um and i think that that's that's the problem let me just double check that that's right yeah 100 112 db spl S boy is it spl or i can't read that okay anyways um you get the idea it's a sensitive headphone so um to compare this against the hd 600 it kind of doesn't make that much sense because because of what people are doing with the hd 600 um to compare this against again some of those other ones in this price bracket i do think that the other ones are more technical but that's not to say that this is a poor performer in any way um and i th i think that uh you know compared to i'm just thinking compared to other options out there that people love this is at, this is certainly more uh, technical like compared to the uh, r70x from audio technica this is significantly more detailed it doesn't have that sort of haze or grain going on so there's really nothing wrong on the technical side um, for this one and actually i'm going to go as far as to say that compared to the 600 and 650s these have much a much better presentation of space and stage they're more spacious uh overall um they're not as impactful and dynamic as the focals um and for for you know uh, immediacy of initial leading edge and clarity of trailing ends of tones and all of the fine gradations of volume and all that kind of stuff which very well could be frequency response just like you know chill out on that <laughs> argument um it's uh it doesn't have that any of that sort of blunted character right that i sometimes worry about like uh, like these ones here these are su super blunted and dull sounding for the trailing ends of tones even though the separation qualities on them it's it's outstanding right so um for these it's like it doesn't have as much of the separation that the aeons do but it doesn't have the blunted character for trailing ends of tones it's not lopped off there um so uh, that, I hope that kind of gives you a sense of how I hear uh, the 109 Pros compared to some of the others in that in that price category. No, it is not the value king in that in that space. Uh, you know, if you're looking for best value, best sound quality value for money, your options are. I mean, HE6 as EV2, right? Is it like five hundred, six hundred dollars regularly? I would do. I think that is you know definitely going to be better value for money there, right? If I mean. It, you know, there's also the, the weight considerations and the build quality and all that, right? But like, let's just talk sound quality. That one is 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 better. Um, you know, I would suggest the Focal LX and Focal Clear. Get you know, they're they're more technical. Um, and then I would also suggest that even even some of the high femen, you know, like the Anandas and whatnot, are are more technical as well. Um, but uh, but anyways, regardless of all of that, uh. This still is a very pleasant sounding headphone, and I think a lot of people were kind of upset about the price because it it resembles the 99 Classic, which is less much less expensive. Um, like if you just sort of see them from afar, there's like a familiarity there, right, with the 99 Classic. And then also, you know, people sort of think because of the naming scheme that oh, it's just an open 99 Classic. How how why and how does opening it up make it cost that much more? And the reality is is that this is nothing like the 99 Classic, um, other than the fact that it kind of has a similar look to it, right? Um, like everything about this one, from the driver design, like I I was even seeing like on Twitter, like there was some some retailer was saying, oh yeah, the 99 Classic, but open. It's like that's not what this is. Um, this is a custom driver. It's a larger custom. The whole thing is larger as well but it's a custom driver that they developed in-house it's also um it's a lot more comfortable than the 99 and also like the entire construction of the of the baffle and like that the housing and the cup is all different it's all like this compared to the 99 classic like the 99 classic looks and feels more like a toy well, i guess these are all toys but like you get what i mean like they're it's it's like uh you can tell it's a much more uh, simple and direct approach in the 99 classic whereas on this one it's a more complicated and sophisticated approach to the baffle design and the, you know the way that the that you just look into it and, and you can you can tell um so um at this price point i th the, the the cool thing about these in my mind is that like you know where the empyrean and the elite i felt were not like like you, you should probably be considering them for all the other reasons, like their comfort and the, like the ergonomics, the build quality, the aesthetics, and all of that. I think the same is true for these, right? But 
now we're talking about something that is, you know, that's not $3,000, right? <laughs> so the distance overall is less, I think. And, and I do think that, you know, those things matter, um, as, as a lot of people do. Um, and now the barrier to entry for those things is less because, you know, it's not, we're not talking like, you know, exponential uh, amounts of difference here as far as price is concerned. Um, does that make sense? Let's um, let's dive into the compare or the uh, the Q and A. Uh, so uh, let's first do questions on the 109 Pros versus the or, what, sorry. <laughs> let's do questions on the 109 Pros and also questions on the Oracle Mark IIs, and then we can also talk do some you know spicy hour uh, stuff as well after that. So uh, I'm going to dive into the questions here. Uh, feel free to drop them now uh, if you haven't already. Uh, I see here there's a question of how would you compare the 109 Pro versus the DT1990 Pro? Um, well, the DT1990 Pro is a headphone I would never be able to listen to without EQ because that 8.5K peak is just ridiculous. Um, it's it's And it's also got like a... It's got another peak somewhere as well. And it's this weird sort of shimmering character that Chrono actually identified. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, d I don't think, as, f as far as the tuning is concerned, there's no contest. The 109 Pros are far superior. Um, it does It is not like listening at two different volumes. But, um, you know, for people who are specifically looking for a studio tool where they're trying to, you know, uh, correct for sibilance in a mix... You know, then sure that <laughs> the ninety nine or nineteen ninety pro uh, might be more appropriate there. What? Okay. People keep talking about the uh, the Austrian audio stuff. I need to get one in. I can't. Yeah, I haven't heard one yet. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, the 109 should be $500, 550 max. Um, I mean, I'm inclined to think that most things should cost, you know, less than a thousand, like even the exorbitantly priced stuff, like the $4,000 stuff, there's, it doesn't need to cost that much. Um, but here's the reality. The price of something in the market is what people are willing to pay. It has nothing to do with build quality, it has nothing to do with sound quality, it has nothing to do with value, Right. It, that's just the reality of literally anything, any industry. It's what people are willing to pay. And if you think that it should cost $500 or $550, and again, if I'm thinking about where this fits for sound quality, I'm probably inclined to agree. But the reality is, you know, make it for $500, make it for $550. And if you do that, uh, congratulations, you have a headphone company. <laughs> right? So it, there's so much more that goes into this than just the sound quality. Uh, the, you know, there's, there's the, the, the design, the R and D, the build, you know, there's, uh, being able to, uh, put, you know, have enough margins in there to be able to sustain the actual development of the product. Um, that's, that's kind of what, you know, often gets missed in these conversations. And so that's why, like, you know, if we're, if if we're saying, yeah, these should cost 500, 550, I, I mean, if, I, I would love it <laughs> if these were less expensive too. But the reality is, is that it's ability and willingness to pay, my dudes. Please don't buy DT1990 Pro. Thank you. <laughs> um, if you if you typed in questions before about uh, either of these two headphones, um, Type them now. Uh, put them in now so we can get to them because I, I definitely would have missed that in the past. Uh, 1990 second peak is at 12K. Yeah, I think you could be right there. I think you could be right. Um, missed your impressions of the Oracle Mark II. What's your TLDR? It is not necessarily better than the original. It is just a little bit brighter. That's the TLDR. So maybe better for certain genres, but less good for others. Does the Meze pair well with the A90? I have no idea. Um... <laughs> but that, that's kind of uh, just to kind of circle back on that topic with the Meze 109 Pro. I get why they want to they want to make it more drivable from 
you know, without needing an amplifier. I get it. You want to make sure your thing is accessible to the widest audience. And like, we are all about like amplifiers and all like we, we have that equipment, right? But the general public does not. And, um, and so, you know, the headphone industry and the amplifier industry, are, they're ships passing in the night, right? Um, so that is, for me, a downside to the 109 Pros is that I can't run them off of tube amps, you know, well, there's some tube amps you could, but like, that are like ultra low noise, maybe, but like out of the tube amps that I specifically am using, I'm not able to run these because there's noise. Um, and as far as like, you know, the things that you pair it with, well, you want to pair it with a low noise amplifier. That's key for these. So don't look at Synad, look at the actual noise floor uh, or like the noise, you know, levels there. Um, I would suggest you want it to perform very well on noise. And in my case, um, yeah, like the IJ6 is not suitable for this, but, uh, you know, there's um, the, the THX AAA1 is dead silent. So that works. Um, with the price of the OG clear, would you choose the Meze 109 Pro over it? Okay. Yes for comfort, no for sound quality. All right. So if you're if you're sitting at your desk for long hours of the day, you will you will in, probably um, enjoy the feeling of wearing the 109 Pros more. But you know the clears definitely have the technical advantage in terms of both detail and punch. The 109 Pros are more spacious. A lot of people have been comparing 109 Pro with the Empyrean. Is the tuning similar? Um, no, but no, but there there are certain things about the tuning that are similar. Like the upper treble lift is similar on both, uh, and that's sort of like slightly warmer, um, you know, mid bass and upper bass. From a technicality and presentation style, ignore the tuning and build. Ignoring the tuning and build. Why would we ignore the tuning and build? Uh, standpoint, what would you compare the Meze 109? Okay, so just technical, okay. Um, just technical? Maybe that Harmonic Dyn Zeus, maybe. Um, or maybe a, I mean, I, I say that, it's kind of not. Um, hmm. It's somewhere HD 600-ish, but but again, like that's not for soundstage because soundstage is, on these is much better, but that's, you know, the tuning is different enough as well where that would be a factor. Um, so what else? There is a sense in which this is almost kind of similar to one of those Biodynas. Not quite, because it doesn't have quite the slam and impact, but um, yeah, hard to say. It's more detailed than the than like the the bears, right? Like those the those um, 990s and 880s and stuff. Like those ones, they don't do very well for image separation. Um, these ones do. Uh, they're they're much better for that. Um, so they're closer to like those the Sennheisers for for that quality, but also not on the level of like an Ananda or um, Edition XS. So yeah, for technicalities, me yeah, I don't think it's wrong to say somewhere around that Harmonic Dyn Zeus level. But of course, the tuning is very different, right? That one's very V-shaped. This one is 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 not I, like it is a subtle V or subtle kind of almost U-shaped kind of thing, if that makes sense. Would the 109 realistically have a place in your own personal collection? Yes, um, yes, it would, uh, because again, I index quite heavily for comfort when I'm just like at home working all day, right? So it would be the the you know chilled out. And um, I didn't show you guys this, but I have dialed in my EQ a little bit. Um, so I and it's it's a, it's actually quite subtle. I basically let me just see if I can sh pull this up here. All right. Uh, one second. Boom, boom. There we go. So, all right, so this is, these are the measurements, right? You can see. Well, hold on. Um, so this is what I'm talking about, where it's just a little bit of a brightness up top, and a bit of that warmth. It's very subtle, um, and again, not not that different from like uh, an Ananda, right? Or an Aria. It's a little, a little different, but not that different. Um, and then here's my EQ for it, right? So here is what I'm actually doing. 
So I kind of boost the, I boost 2K a little bit. I kind of downshelf the treble a little bit and, you know, reduce 12K. I think actually the peak that I hear is, is probably around 10K, but there is also some brightness and brilliance up above that. So I just kind of, you know, wide cue it and, and reduce that by a little bit. And then I kind of, you know, sub bass lift it because that's, that's just a me thing. It's what I prefer. Okay. Let's keep going. I just want to do a couple more here on the 109 Pro and then also the Oracle Mark II and then we can go into spicy hour, all right? Um, someone's asking variations versus Oracle Mark II. <sighs> if it's me, uh, you know, I do use the Qtlux 5K and I reduce the upper mids on the variations. I would probably go variations. It is more technical. Oh yeah, you guys noticed I shaved my head. <laughs> it was it was getting time, you know. It was... Uh, I was like, either I can go to go to Turkey and get a hair implant or whatever, or I can just buzz it. I figured, what the hell? Why not? <laughs> and actually, I can tell people that it's it's so that, you know headphones fit better because I you know big audiophile head. But uh, you know, it also has the added benefit of making me more aerodynamic and faster in a straight line. <laughs> Yeah. So what you're saying is pick up a, a pair of 109 Pros. Not necessarily. Um, again, this is the. I'm not going to tell you, you know, what to do with your money. Do whatever you want with that. I, and this is why I'm also saying, like, for value for money, you know, that's not that's not what this is about. This is about like, you you got to be into the comfort and the you know the looks of of this, right? Like, let me just. Just the build and everything. Um, I think that those factors sh should play a role in your decision making for this, as I think they do for most people, right? And again, if you're looking for the best value there for sound quality, you got Sundaras and HD 600s and HD 6 SE V2s, you know, Edition XSs. That's really where that value for money thing comes into consideration. At the high end, it's also, you know, for Alexas and Clears. Um, for sound when it comes to sound quality um these are not far from that conversation I'll, I'll put it to you that way um but for comfort these are clearly ahead of everything on that list and also for the build and the and the aesthetic and all that stuff you know if you're into that if you're if you like this kind of look which i personally do i don't like the 99s for the look but this looks much more refined and classy to me 109 pro versus the cat ear headphones you review <laughs> <laughs> yeah 109 pros for sure um so the 109 pro is going to going to be your daily driver no because i don't own this headphone <laughs> if i if i were to buy it maybe um this is just one i'm borrowing from the office um no I, you know these days i actually like for daily driver stuff i i use the uh, i use iems a lot more regularly just because i spend a lot of time uh like I spend a lot of time, you know, in front of like at my desk working on stuff. And I find that, you know, the headphones that I enjoy listening to the most are, you know, often a little bit heavy. Like the HE6 regular, like the original six screw HE6. Um, yeah, Focal Allier with the Utopia pads is still is still a go-to off of the Kenzie, specifically the 32 ohm out. But again, for people who listen to stuff at absurd absurd volumes you don't want to be doing that because you know the clipping thing it's going to reduce the the volume threshold there um you know the daily driver stuff it's hard to say like for clothes back it would probably be the radiance these days or honestly that aeon x clothes because it's pretty comfortable so yeah if if i were this is one where like it factors quite strongly into my consideration of what I would personally buy because it is, you know, very comfortable. It is very easy to to get along with. I think the reason why I wouldn't buy it is because it's not that great at uh, pairing with, um, you know, high impedance. Well, sorry, it's high and, you know, maybe 
less optimal uh, for noise two amps. Th these are open backs, so they're not they're not going to drown out plain noise, my dude. <laughs> these are not for travel. Like, let's be clear, these are open back headphones, right? Sound leaks in and out. Does the 109 Pro make sense if I already own the Aria SE and R70X? Is it complementary for rock and metal genre? Uh, I So, no. I, I actually think what you should look for for rock and metal is something that is a little bit warmer. Um, I don't know what that might be. Maybe an LCD 2. Yeah, LCD 2. Like an extra 200 bucks, roughly, I think, gets you an LCD. Not the classic, but the LCD 2F. You get that one. Um, that's what, Or at least that's what I would do. You know, and then just EQ to your heart's content if you find that you want. Because those ones can take EQ, like, yeah, crazy good. Um, how did the 109 Pros rank for comfort, comfortability? <laughs> uh, very high. I think the Imperians are probably still a little bit more comfortable. Just a little bit, but these are very high. Um, what else is... I was just having a think about that. Like, what are the most comfortable headphones out there? Uh, and, I mean, these are on that list. The Imperians are on that... Like, the Elites are on that list. Most comfortable. Um, I find the HD100S to be comfortable, but I know not everybody does. Like, I know that some people are like, oh, yeah, the top piece, it's like... It's not great. Um, but for me, it's totally fine. Uh, I find the Hi-Fi Man Aria to be quite comfortable. Susvara is also quite comfortable, right? Those ones are great. Yeah. Uh, the Aeon, some of these Aeons are, not all, like the Aeon Noir and these these newer ones. The older Aeons had, like, the pads were stiffer somehow, or for some reason they had a stronger clamp. Um, yeah. 109 versus Aurorus Borealis. Yeah, I think that's a closer comparison. I think the Borea... Mm. <laughs> that's that's a closer one. I think the Borealis is it, it's it's punchier, um, but yeah, I'd have to have them side by side. I think I think for technical performance, I do think the Borealis is probably a little bit maybe. Well, it's certainly punchier, but it also has like that kind of bass lift that's a little bit more distinct, so hard to say. Oracle Mark, yeah, you guys are asking again Oracle Mark II variations. And if it's me EQing it, variations, no EQ, Oracle Mark II, but that's also for certain genres only. In that price bracket, for me, it's still the SA6. Let's see. I th yeah, I would need. I need. I want to get another Borealis in. The things that I wasn't too keen on with the Borealis is that there's like a five point two or five point three k peak, um, and then there's also a kind of like mid. It's there's a forward character at around, I want to say like one point five k something like that, um, but for the rest of the tuning, it's really really nice. Um, and so yeah, for technical performance, it's more just differently technical. I'd say that if you if you are all about the slam, then probably go for the Borealis because it has that more distinct bass lift. Um, whereas this one's just more; it has a little bit more of that more gradual presence. I find at least. <laughs> okay. All right, spicy take time. Let's let's go, guys. If I miss your question on the Oracle, feel free to ask. I yeah, I didn't see that many on it, so. How are you doing? Hey, how's it going, Sleepy Rhythms? Good to see you. It's nice to see everybody that I yeah I haven't seen you guys in a while. It's been over a month. You know, because I've been doing, I've been, yeah, we did Can Jam and I've been traveling as well. So, um, there'll be more stuff on that coming out soon. 
but that's kind of why I've been taken away from doing, you know, reviews and live streams and stuff like that, right? I can only be in so many places at once. <laughs> New Yamahas do look interesting, yeah. I'm curious about those. What happened to your Allegia? I actually took it apart. <laughs> I wanted to modify it. Don't 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 do what I do. <laughs> um Yeah, actually at some point um we should do like a what, you know, what which headphones do we personally own or would we personally buy like of of the team? We'll probably do something like that. You know, which equipment do we buy and why? Because we have different priorities, and I think it's important to know that. Um, okay, are, are the Meze 109 good for trouble-sensitive people? No. Does the Meze 109 Pro scale well? Uh, I'm going to say also no. That's why I wanted the higher impedance version, so I could run it off of more stuff. Diana V2 or MM500? I can't answer that. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, like, I need to compare them and I ha I heard the V2 like once at a show so Meze 109 Pro or Norman NDH30 the Norman NDH30 is not it's really dull sounding I'm sorry <laughs> with all the apologies to Zeos like it's uh it's one of the dullest sounding headphones I've heard <laughs> hey thank you thank you Sleepy I d did I run into you at, at CanJam I feel like if I didn't, I am so sorry, and and next time we'll have to connect. I I, I you were, I'm pretty sure you were there. Um, there was just yeah, it was a whirlwind. So, oh, we did. Yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it, like it's all a blur in my head. So, <laughs> yeah. Can you confirm grainy footage of Resolve lookalike mounting planar prototypes on former Harmon heads? In an acoustic bunker? What is that? <laughs> is there like is that something that's happening? Um Andrew, what would you recommend to reduce the heat of the cups on a focal close back like the Elegia? I find they build up a lot of heat when I wear them during the day. Yeah, I can't really help you with that. I don't know. Um that's a it's a you know, problem that people face <laughs> with not just with those headphones, but with a lot of headphones. Um, yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, my ears get kind of warm in these as well, right? What's your favorite tribrid? Man, I heard that, 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 I want to do a review of it. I heard that Empire Ears uh, A and K collab uh, at CanJam, and that thing was insane. <laughs> for its technical performance. There was something in the treble that I wasn't too keen about, but man, was that ever impressive. Um, so I want to get that in. Right At the moment, that's like the one I'm the most excited to hear uh, or like get, you know, spend time with. Like that was like, it was like the perfect combination of the Odin and the Evo and it has a little bit less upper mids compared to the, the Odin. So like, yeah, I, I was into it. Um... All right. Um, did you try the ZMF Caldera? Actually, I'm just going to answer Sleepy's first because, yeah, I mentioned this before, uh, about the 109 on tubes. I bet they would be okay on tubes, like, for the sound, but because of tubes often having a higher noise floor and the high sensitivity of these, it's, it's a challenge to find that. You'd have to, like, you could do it probably, but maybe you'd have to run, like, some sort of, some sort of filter in between. Uh, I'm not sure how you would do that. So I'm going to say, don't expect to be able to plug this directly into any tube amplifier and have it be fine. Um, but yeah, uh, let me just sort of answer that other question there. The Caldera, yeah. Um, it was very interesting. I'm very, cu I'm very curious about that one. Um, it has a similar kind, a reminiscent kind of tuning to some of the other ZMFs that I've heard. Um, but uh, definitely it was, I mean, I, this is my perspective on planar versus dynamic is that like, yes, there are some very detailed dynamic driver headphones, but I think planars, they have an advantage in that department. And as far as instrument separation goes, they clearly have an advantage. And so this was now, you know, something that 
uh, was in his EMF kind of tuning as well, which I thought was, was pretty cool. Um, yeah, um, yeah, and I have heard the Expanse as well, um, and the and the Utopia twenty twenty two. So if you guys want to know about those, we can talk about those. Um, I will be doing a write up at some point about the Expanse and my experience with it. I, I put a little bit of time into it, um, did some EQ as well, of course, as I always do. <laughs> um, but I I don't want to I don't want to give like a full judgment on it because I'm actually sending it over to DMS to review. So he's going to be doing the review of that one, I think. Um, mainly because I, I, uh, I just, yeah, don't have time. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, and, and so there's, there's so much stuff that I have to do right now that is behind the scenes. So that's why, like, some of your guys' uh, like, I haven't been able to produce videos generally um, as, as often as I would have liked. Um, that's going to change. I will eventually do more videos again. Um, but uh, these are ones that we want to cover as soon as possible. So I have to be like, okay, well, who's available to do that? And DMS is available. Um, and Chrono is going to be doing, I think, the Utopia 2022. Um, and then, yeah. Get a desk fan. <laughs> oh, you mean for the helping with the, yeah. The ear heat issue. Uh, what do you think about Jude critiquing reviewers these days for only reviewing measurements? As can jump talk, this is a great question. Are you there? Um, if you were, um, uh, say hi next time. <laughs> oh, maybe you did, and I just I, I forgot that there was a lot of meet and greet, which was great. Yeah, I did sit. Through, I, I did go to his talk. Um, so I actually really liked his talk. Um, I. I disagree with a couple of things, or it's not that I disagree, it's that I think there's a little bit more nuance that, that would be required for that point to really land. Because I think what he's, like, you have to think about maybe the broad broad strokes, general kind of, like, concept behind his argument, not the specific examples, I think. And for the concept, I, I do agree. I think, you know, it's when people are, like, if you, imagine you just took graphs away, right? Like, the horror, right? <laughs> like, the, the horror of taking graphs away. But, like, imagine you just, like, there was no graph information available, right? Um, you would probably end up with very different judgments about about things. And I think that's, that's in part, yes, because of human fallibility. But there's also another part where... Um, the reading of graphs creates a kind of confirmation bias that is not necessarily representative of what the actual experience is like. So you have like, and, and I, go, I go the other way, right? Like I think that the majority of this, the majority of what this hobby and what this industry is, 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 is about confidence, right? When people getting confidence from various different sources and then a, an expression of that confidence after they've bought something as a matter of confirmation bias. Or I mean, it's not it's not as a matter of confirmation, but it's it's that's what they're doing. It's it's a kind of confirmation bias that you see, and depending on where you get that confidence from, um, you know, like if you're getting that confidence from what people have said on HeadFi, that 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 could be very different from where you get that confidence from from looking at graphs or reading something on ASR or that you know, like all, all this kind of stuff. D different places, SBAF's another example. Um, so depending on where you, you're getting that, that confidence from, it's going to result in a different kind of confirmation bias. But that's not to say that like people who only look at graphs aren't, you know, that they're, that they're somehow immune from confirmation bias because they're not. And the graph gives you that kind of bias as well. And there are, there are some very strong examples of that that I think I'm, well, I'm going to talk about it at some point. Um, but there are very strong examples of that. Um, and I think this is kind of, I don't know if this is the exact point that Jude was making, but like that, the second half of that I think is congruent with his position there, and so that's really what that's kind of what I took from it, um, and I completely agree with his his sentiment that like if uh, if if you only care about target adherence and you know you. You just want to do one, like sweep one side of a headphone, and and not look at anything else, and just just look at target compliance. Why would does anybody care about anything other than an AKG K three seventy one? Now I think the AKG K three seventy one, if you look at the actual frequency response, it does deviate a little bit, right? So it's it's not you know, it's not um, 
I think the point would land a bit better if you use something like a radiance or I don't know, like something else that's maybe a little bit more you know exact to the target there um or like an aeon 2 noir maybe or actually hell the aeon close x is a great example of that right why would we why would we ever want anything other than that and i think that that point is a good one um i really do think that that's a good point because um and, and, and it's one where like I'm not going to put a specific number to this, but the overwhelming majority of people claiming X, Y, and Z about headphones based on target adherence in a graph have never heard them. They've never heard those headphones. They've never heard the ones they're talking about. They've never heard headphones that they would otherwise compare against. They've never heard the headphones that don't measure as well as ones that do. They have no idea. They don't have actually any experiential familiarity or knowledge with the equipment that they're passing judgment on with respect to looking at a graph. And I, I think Jude is kind of trying to, you know, create a little bit of like, um, he's trying to inoculate against that a little bit because that's a trend that is incre that's gained momentum. And in that sense, I really appreciate his efforts. Um, and I, I, I think that's something that this community really needs. Um, so, there's a lot of madness out there and he's doing what he can to to quell it even though i i also there are some things that i disagree with about his talk as well like for example it's very easy to know just from listening to something which region of a frequency response is elevated or recessed like if if something sounds shouty to me i know why and I know I can tell you exactly which frequencies are are boosted. Now I am also not a human, you know, a human FFT, as he pointed out. Nobody is. I'm perfectly capable of being fallible. But as an example, when I heard the 109 Pros in Munich for the first time, I said, "Oh, it sounds like it's a little bit downward tilted, a little bit warmer in the in the up, mid and upper bass, and a little bit brightened at 12k or like in the upper treble." And sure enough, <laughs> you know, it's it doesn't take a lot to be able to recognize this stuff when you're just listening to music. And I think it I think it's perfectly fine to talk about frequency response, even if you're not looking at a graph. But you know, that's why I think his point needed to go a little further and say specifically if you're looking at a graph, right? There's a chance that what you're doing is just reviewing a graph, not actually what the headphones sound because of coupling, you know, it could sound different than what the graph actually shows. And when you are doing the measurements, you know that it actually does have differences from what you're going to hear, um, especially above 5K because of the HRTF you know, variation. Anyways, that that's that rant. Um, oh, thank you, Equal Peace. Uh, cheers. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, Grumpy, do, do, does that answer your question? Um, uh, what what was your take on it? If you if you were there, let me know what you thought. Because I I I I want more. I want those talks to to have a, a larger audience. I want more people. I these are like regardless of whether you agree or disagree. Like more people should be thinking about stuff. Should be thinking about these discussions. Um, you know, rather than like a blind kind of like, you know so-and-so says x is great or x is terrible therefore you know like like i think those discussions are super important so um I, I i don't know if there's a video of it or if it's live somewhere um that we can that we can watch beca because i'd love that there to be that oh no it's it's definitely it's it's jude Um. All right, let's keep going, guys. Spicy hour is upon us. Oh, you guys wanted to know about the um, Susvara versus the Expanse, someone asked? Or the Utopia 2022? So, okay, uh, I can give some, some thoughts on Utopia 2022. Um, I think it's it's very similar in sound to the original. So if you own the original, I don't know if you need to go out and, 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 and buy the you know 2022 version. Um, the, the only difference is that the new version is a little bit warmer there in the treble, like just a few dB. Um, 
And so for people who found the original to be too bright or fatiguing in the treble, then maybe there's a reason to check out the new one, right? But I don't think it's like, there's nothing really that different about the sound, you know? Um, so if you if you love the original, you're probably going to like the new one. If you didn't like the original, there's a chance that you would like the new one, but, you know, it's similar enough in other respects that there might be similar things that you're not as into, right? That's, uh, yeah, how I would describe that one. Uh, do you agree with Tile's si style of review where he would try to explain measurement and design even if it would mean talking, taking the headphones apart? Yeah, I, I'm i much more interested in that than, than, you know, talking about value for money. <laughs> I, I know I have to. I know I have to talk. Like, that's stuff that people are interested in, right? Because they're wondering, hey, is this something that I should consider? And I am not at all interested. In, like, I, I couldn't care less what people buy. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. I'm far more interested in, like, you know, like, hey, like, this is, like, like this is super cool, right? Like, this, this freaking thing makes sound go, right? Like, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I would love to, I would be much more interested in, in doing it that way and talk about the design. But the problem is, is that, like, that is, that is so inaccessible for people who just want to know, does it sound good, right? Or what does it sound like, more specifically? Um, so yeah, I do agree with that style. I I, mean, I agree with I do ap appreciate that style, and I would love to do more of that. But but I also have to be respectful that the audience doesn't necessarily care about that, or like a certain like a large you know, percentage doesn't. So I need to temper that a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that isn't figured out yet. That's that's, you know, and man, like you, if you, there's stuff that you read online where it's like, holy crap, these people have no idea what the hell they're talking about, <laughs> um, and uh, and it's but like you just you don't, it's not worth it to engage. Sometimes <laughs> you're not gonna you know change the world by doing that. That's <laughs> Taryn told me your resume was hanging out and drinking whiskey for a year. <laughs> I don't know if it was a year. We definitely we definitely hung out and like nerded out about headphones, right? Like we were drinking. We we did drink whiskey at there. We would just hang out, like you know, I'd go over and visit. And we'd listen to headphones and like chat about the community stuff and and have whiskey. But uh, but yeah, I remember we also would we would regularly go to like a nearby uh kind of like a beer house type thing um and uh yeah so that's that's how i met those guys favorite dap i'm not a dap guy to be honest i mean i like that what was it the dx 300 i thought that was good but it's kind of like it's an extra thing right so if i'm a, I'm a cute looks 5k kind of guy <laughs> Yeah, it was super cool seeing Zach take that that Caldera apart. Like he was just like, here, here, here you go. Here's the driver. I was like, wow, that's that's really cool. <laughs> How much cable loving was it, Can Jam? Oh, I got I got a fun one for you, Chef Steve. So I'm gonna do a video on this, but and 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 people are people are going to crucify me for this right now. But you will see, you will see. <laughs> I I found a cable that actually did make a difference. And I, this isn't actually something that's just a subjective thing. It's, it's actually a measurable difference. Um, and so I'm going to do a video that is going to be like proof. You know, um, The thing is that ordinarily cables, they don't make a difference, right? But in this one particular instance, it, it did. And there's a very good reason why. And it has to do with the headphones that were being driven. Like I think there's like two headphones where this would, maybe three, where this where you, the difference would actually show up. But it, was, it wasn't just that it changed the sound. It, it made it warmer. But it wasn't just that. It was also quite a bit louder. Um, and it's like a, it's one of those things where it's like anybody would be able to tell, tell a difference. Like it's so obvious. And we actually filmed it. right? But it needs the context for why, for that specific headphone that was being driven. It was the RAL ribbon, uh, the, the RAL um, Circumoral, right? And the reason for that, I'm told, is that it's, it's basically... If, if you have head, headphones that have basically no impedance, right, then th something like this could actually change it. Um, so I, I need to reach out to uh, Skedra to get him to send that one over so I can measure it and, and do the proof thing. But that's going to be kind of catchy because I think it's like, it's wading into a controversial topic that shouldn't be controversial. Um, and I'm going to use it as kind of like, you guys are seeing behind the curtain a little bit, but like I'm going to use that as a way of explaining why in 
in 99% of you know situations, you won't see that difference um, in in cables. But in the one percent, whatever, whatever, like the one, the he- the couple of headphones where this matters, uh, you do. Um, and the and here's the thing too, because people will. Like if, if, if that's ever used to demonstrate a difference in cables, that's also misleading because it won't matter any other time. <laughs> so. Or I, I shouldn't say any other time because there are potentially other, I'm thinking maybe that, that Odyssey LCD-R or some certain IEMs there might be. But yeah, for normal headphones, that's not something you need to worry about. Actually, so disregarding capacitance and resistance is going to be part of it. Well, so I will mention it, yeah. But I think that the the more interesting thing is that this is going to show a measurable difference in frequency response and also sound pressure level. So, yeah, that's going to be fun. All right, uh, more more spicy hour, guys. Let's keep going. Yeah, and DH30, it's not for me, man. Like, DMS and I both heard it in Munich, and we were both, like, super underwhelmed by it. Like, it's not... It's just nothing that interesting. Like, there's... is, it, it, You know, like, where I've described the Aeon... Like, these Aeon Open Xs, which I do use, actually. They're... they're I think they're very good um, for their ergonomics, but but the, the tuning, it, sorry, the closer are, are are very good. The the opens I think are less good. Um, but anyways, the point being is that they have that sort of like blunted, lopped off character for trailing ends of tones, and um, and uh, yeah, the NDH thirties had that as well, but even more strong. So. Now, some people are totally fine with that quality, but for me, like, that is an absence of detail, right, with the NDH 30s. Um, what's up, Michael K? You bugged me about not doing a live stream for a while. Yeah, it's because I was there. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. Uh, yeah, I mean, 650 is way more detailed than an NDH 30. There was no contest. Impedance adapters are extreme examples of cables making a difference that anyone can hear. Yeah, that's that's actually an interesting way of putting it. Um yeah, like things were like you know it, it it should be obvious, right? What I don't, what I don't like is the idea though that like this magical material is going to make your headphones open up and sound. You know, like if we can talk about these things in tangible you know means like impedance adapters, you know, fine. Or you know what the effect of an impedance change is going to have on X headphone, right? That takes X. You get the idea, right? tangible measurable differences like I, I know i talk about stuff that is like subjective of course right but if there are if there are ways of talking about things in tangible objective means we should also do that <laughs> by blunt do you mean lack of trouble i mean the like it's okay if you ever want to experience this to the extreme listen to the drop panda that is the dullest blunt most blunted sounding thing ever for trailing ends of tones like it is just i actually think that that quality comes from a, uh and this was a conversation i had i don't know if i want to give away with who but a engineer um we we're talking about where some of this comes from and we were discussing that you know it could potentially be a ratio of stiffness to compliance and the ultra stiff stuff, like so, it's not one specific indicator. Like, one, it's not like oh, the thinner the, or the the more compliant the diaphragm, the better, or the stiffer the diaphragm, the better. It's it's specifically a ratio that you're looking for, which makes a certain amount of sense. Um, but yeah, like the other thing that I was I came away very sure of from CanGem was that either people like have no idea what good sound is or there's so much more to this than just one person's experience and I kind of lean towards the latter <laughs> um expanse versus Susvara and lcd5 oh yeah didn't talk about the expanse yet um yeah so for technical performance the lcd5 and Susvara on are, are on another level like it's it they're you know higher up considerably i don't i don't know 
like the expanse is really all about the tuning there um the one thing okay the one thing about the expanse that i i noticed like and i i, I couldn't unnotice this it was the way so if you watch jude's interview with dan right they're talking about jude mentions how uh the expanse has so the, the dca headphones the closed back sound more open and the open back sound more closed he gave some description like that i think and this was the quality that i noticed very strongly about the expanse there's something about it and i can't figure this out um because i tried to i, I tried eqing i tried all kinds of different stuff and it, it still always had this quality but yeah it definitely sounded more closed than um than an open back headphone you know than i would expect from an open back headphone and it's hard to really pinpoint that I'm not really sure why like I, even, I, ch I tried changing the frequency response to make it be more sound stagey right and it didn't you know or i tried you know eqing it right but where that was the result and and it didn't really change that quality at all so um yeah i i was joking that the expanse is kind of like greenland where like the 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 the, the name is uh it's expanse but it it's you know this the soundstage presentation is a, is a it's i shouldn't it's not like it's not like the images are cl are closer it's like it's like everything is just like super intense somehow uh for the staging and like right here <laughs> uh that's 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 my description of the of the soundstage so if you're uniquely interested in that quality i would suggest you know hd100s or something else uh, something that is more shaped to, to to be suitable there um but that was the biggest thing for me with the expanse um and uh, the ergonomics are fantastic on it um i do think so the other thing is that with the meta materials the like really sophisticated waveguide thing that they're doing um that's like with a headphone like the expanse where you have like okay i'll show you on this one right you have the elongated kind of cups a little bit. Imagine this is the expanse, right? It's sort of like a teardrop shape or like a, yeah, it's a longer shape, not not round. Well, I guess these are ovals, but you get the idea. Um, there's a lot of room for your ears on the inside and depending on kind of where you position it, um, it can dramatically change the sound because the waveguide is set up, I I imagine, so that it's, it's trying to, you know, be more surgical about the frequencies that you know are being affected and if you have it slightly in the wrong position it can it can i found at least it can sound quite weird um they recommend that you go like kind of down and forward like like have your ear very close to the back and the top of of that one um which i found did that was the best that it sounded but it's kind of like when you put it on you have to remember that right and you have to kind of like force it down a little bit and then and then have it like stay there rather than like what might feel initially like the most obvious way of wearing it um so there's that and i think if anybody is listening to it they should probably play around with that to for the for the tuning to be what it shows on the rig in ideal you know situations um i do have a measurement of it but i'm going to post that on the forum so you guys can wait for that um but yeah, I don't want to talk too much else about the expanse. Um, I'll, I'm gonna let DMS talk about that. Um, but I, for anybody wondering, as far as the technical qualities, I, I don't, I wouldn't put that driver on the the level of this is far or LCD five, just just straight up. Um, and I don't think, I don't think that we should be surprised by that, to be honest. Um, because n those ones are certainly not as comfortable. I guess this is as far as comfortable. Um, let's continue. Do we know if Focal has any headphones coming into the mid-fi range, like 500 bucks? No idea. No idea. Um, yeah, like, here's the thing. Like, like I've been to the Focal, like, factory. Like, I know those guys, but, like, I there's no new and unique information that they give me uh, about you know this kind of stuff understandably you guys a lot of people asking about the original clear versus meze 109 
um, definitely the clear uh, for sound quality for comfort the 109 um, <laughs> a lot of you guys are asking about the hi-fi and Ananda stealth um, <laughs> the funny thing is that uh, I bet they measure nearly identical this is the thing people need to learn about the stealth magnets is that the only thing that the stealth magnets really affect is in the upper upper treble right and it's on some of the headphones, it's it, it's so minimal that like you would not be able to tell a difference at all. On, on other ones, it is more noticeable. Like on the Aria Stealth, it is actually a measurable, tangible difference, but it's a subtle thing there. Um, and I expect the same to be the case on the Ananda Stealth as well. Um, and so I don't expect a dramatic difference between Ananda Stealth and, and original Ananda. I expect them to both be excellent, to put it that way. Um... I've heard a lot of Expanse's E stat speed. Mm, very not E staty sounding. It's not about like. Oh, okay. Let me think. No, it sounds more like it sounds more like that, like a traditional planar. Um, like like for for that quality, like East. I was comparing the Expanse and the Bravura right next to each other, and no, like no, 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 it doesn't sound like an E stat. It sounds more like a planar. So, you know, for those qualities like separation, the expanse is very good, yeah. Um, for trailing ends of tones, not on the level, like for clarity there, for trailing ends of tones, not on the level of Susfar or LCD5. Um, but again, I don't, I'm not gonna like, you know, go too in depth on this, that, on that one, because that's that's for DMS to cover. Um, golden, yeah, yeah, I agree with, yeah, Golden heard it as well, yeah. But for me, just that that the the staging difference uh, is the thing that I was, you know, noticing the most. Right. Um, I'm trying to think if there's another headphone that like stages like that one, but I can't think of it. <laughs> um, yeah. Like suffers driver excursion. Only if you're listening at absurd levels or if you're using an EQ. Uh, do you think Sennheiser is going to make it more headphones? They seem busy with IEMs. I would expect they will eventually. I think they're currently, you know, dealing with the changeover to the Sonova. Like, they they sold their consumer division to Sonova. I think that's how you say that. Um, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I imagine eventually they will probably get back to making more headphones. Buh, buh, buh. yeah and this is the problem right like so many of these like i i love all these communities right like where people where there's all this discussion going on about about you know headphones but like a lot of the narratives and the inertia behind that um it has such a ability to influence the decisions that people make right because people speak with such confidence and authority in these places but we have to also recognize that that comes from in both cases, or I say both, in all cases, that comes from a position of confirmation bias where it's the people who bought the thing and it comes from a position of confirmation bias. Like they're they're doing, it's it's an exercise in confirmation of, of basically like purchase validation on the one hand and the other hand it's, oh, look, look at how well it measures relative to Harman. Therefore, it must be excellent. And it's like in both cases, you don't know if it's going to be the right thing for you, right? It's, 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 and you don't know if, if, like and you're certainly not getting you know opinions and judgments that are free from bias the same is true of you know reviewers right the same is true of me like i have there are specific things that i'm looking for i mean th granted i don't you know buy things but like there are specific things that i'm i'm looking for uh in 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 sound quality right and um they, those might not be the things that you're looking for so when i say i don't buy things i mean like i don't you know, I'm constantly listening to headphones, so like I'm I'm not out there. You know, I'm not in the position that you might be in, right? If that makes sense, looking for a headphone to buy. That's not the position that I'm in. I'm looking for. I'm like, oh, can I review this one? I want to review review that one. At certain points, there are things where I'm like, okay, maybe this is something that I would want to buy. Um, this is one of those where I would consider it for the comfort alone. Um, 
Like if I were to buy headphones today, if I was specifically looking for the things that I care about, it would be some. It would be like an original HE6, right? The downside is that it is heavy. Um, other than that, maybe an Aeon 2 Noir uh, for clothes back or Focal Radiance. Those are the kinds of things, right? Stuff that I can wear all day that has a convenience factor. And then I would have like one that's like the, you know, the thing that is the like, I'm going to spend an hour listening, only listening. And, you know, that's the headphone. <laughs> and if I was spending absurd amounts of money, I'd probably go LCD 5 with, uh, with EQ. What's the best sounding headphone you've tried on an OTL tube amp that made a bigger difference than on a solid state amp? This is Vara. Well, okay. No, for OTL? Because, yeah, for tube amp, hmm. So, I just want to give some credit to the Susvara off of that Felix Envy. That was a pairing that was really interesting. Well, it wasn't just me, like a lot of people like that. Um, but specifically, an, like a, yeah, I, I don't know if I would go planar for that. I would probably go, I don't know, like it sounds like a meme, but like, Sennheiser HD 600 <laughs> something like that I don't know something high impedance you guys don't blame Canada blame Canada for many things Canada as my friend calls it um Let's keep going, guys. Where's the where's the spice? Oh, I see uh, supers in the chat. What's up, man? If you bought it yourself, then there's no bias. I know, like, like that's 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 where you get like the most bias. Like, think about like the cognitive processes that are going in, and, and when people are trying to like validate what it is they bought, it's the best thing ever. Like, this is this is why if when I release a video saying how painful the DT1990 is to listen to, you will inevitably get people in the comments being like, you know, basically disagreeing with you, you know, as angrily as possible. It makes them like, upset because they bought it based on somebody's recommendation. And, and they don't like it when people are like, oh yeah, the thing you bought, you know, isn't that great. I can't end up with can't chat. <laughs> Uh, money no object what could be the headphones and amp you would have walked away from can jam so call Aperio. it doesn't I was very straightforwardly the best thing there but I mean it is brighter right that's the thing it's a little more you know ear gain but it's extremely technical um, so definitely that um, other than that Maybe that well, maybe that IEM, the the, the uh, Empire A and K thing, Odyssey. That's what it's called, Odyssey. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. And um, I mean, honestly, the best listening experiences I had were like the at the at the at the Tam Jam. <laughs> Shout out to Tam. They were like in the hotel room afterwards, where there's a whole bunch of stuff we set that was well, I wasn't part of it, but like the, those guys set up. And then we listened to the Phil phone off of the slam stack and compared it against the HE6. That, that was some of the most fun of actual sitting down and listening and comparing things for me. Um, so, yeah. Because, like, the, the rest of the time, a lot of it's, like, you're at the show and you're just, you're, you're kind of, like, engaging with, like, the, the vibe of the show. Spicy take, ZMF Caldera is inferior to many planners, but people are hyped because it's ZMF. Have you heard it? I, I, I mean, this is one of those, right? Where it's like, I don't... If you've heard it, like, let me know what your thoughts are on it. I don't even know if there's measurements out about it. but How are the wand phones with the mecha pads? I mean, obviously they didn't. That didn't sound great, right? That was ridiculous. But, but the bass went up like crazy. 
The mega pads were absurd. <laughs> how are the Sindar closed? The, uh, I love high men open, open backs. Not a fan of their closed backs. That's just sort of how it's been for me and with that. With that. Like, the, it was the treble that was the problem on the Sindar closed. Yeah. Um. Bu -bu -bu. Put the pepper in for spicy takes, so I know you're uh, <laughs> participating in spicy hour. What headphones would Wittgenstein use? <laughs> Abyss. <laughs> uh. Long-term usage trends are a good way to gauge how much you like a headphone. If you have something but can't yourself use it, you don't like it. Yeah, I don't think that's a spicy take. I think that's like a pretty straightforwardly solid take. And this is why comfort is so important to me, right? Some of these other headphones are just like amazing for all whatever qualities, right? But like comfort. Long-term use, right? Isn't it weird how the worst measuring headphones are the ones people claim benefit the most from source? I don't know what you're talking about there. Sisvara Utopian HD 800. Those don't measure badly. Sisvara measures very well, as does the... They all... Utopia and HD 100. I, see, this is a... In my view, this is a failure of our ability to, ability to communicate what is good and bad from a measurement. And it's because, again, the target is very coarse grained and highly smooth to one half octave and the frequency response of headphones is not and ideally shouldn't be so the point is you know you don't know what the fine grain result should be for you and that, that's, a, that's a really difficult concept to try and communicate in an image of a graph and so i, I don't know if jude would agree with that but i to me that's kind of where this problem lies you know when people They'll look at a graph and they'll be like, oh, what's with all the, like, you know, fine-grained, wiggly stuff going on? So, well, that stuff doesn't actually matter. <laughs> or it does matter, but it matters only to the individual, right? Like, it's not a, it's not something we should evaluate in, you know, the, the, the headphone, you know, based on. Um, and, you know, like, the, the Harmon research doesn't either. This is the other thing, like... So, like people need to read the rest of the research. I, I there is a thing I know Sean and I disagree about that one thing about how how fine grained the target should be, but for the most part, like you know, like read the segmentation stuff. The segmentation stuff will will reveal a lot about you know the our relationship to the target we commonly use in practice. All right. Spicy take, Con Max sounds better than DX320, but ANK Wi-Fi performance is just not worth it. You're going to have to, uh, I, I trust your judgment on that because uh, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm not a DAP guy. I, I appreciate what they do, but like for me, I uh, I just, uh, I just uh, dongle it or like Bluetooth dongle it, whatever, the, the Qtlix 5K. But for high end, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, if I was like, yeah trying to, maybe maybe I should get into it because I, I want to do more stuff with IEMs these days um i want to get in like the some of the iams i heard i heard at can jam were just just ridiculous so i want to i want to get more into that world so maybe maybe i should um what's the closest thing to an og he6 still in production probably he6 sev2 is the drivers nearly identical if not i don't know uh the baffle's different, as is the headband. Um, last Rhino says, Kryn would like to apologize to Meze now that the 109 is out. I don't know if Kryn's going to like this one. I have no idea. Like, he might. I, he might not. Um, but this is one that is a little closer to being appropriate for price <laughs> than I think the other ones are. Um But uh, no, like I have nothing but like Meze is a brand is one of my favorite brands. It's like the people there, you know, the and like Meze, the, the like even like talking to the owner, like we're talking, they're talking to Antonio Meze, like just like unbelievably cool. And I wish that more people could could 
get a chance to meet them or learn about that you know part of them they are they're headphone nerds like the rest of us <laughs> and they're super dialed into you know the communities and they yeah just wonderful people so um yeah um that's something that maybe maybe they could hire like a i don't know someone to do videos for them and like you know <laughs> showcase more of the people behind the brand because yeah they're, they're awesome and you know th like we haven't on this channel like our reviews of meze products they have been not the kindest okay right like uh, my review of the Imperium was not that like you know same with well, i don't know what we said about the 99 classic but um same with the lyrics same with the elite right we, we've generally said you know that these are very comfortable very mechanically well designed you know a, a aesthetically amazing um but those are th those things should factor into the decision because the sound quality is not proportional to the asking price we've that's the general trend that we've kind of gone with um as far as our evaluative take um mine at least uh, i think chronos as well maybe i don't know about chronos but yeah um also dms like i think this is um i, I i'm not gonna you know uh do the crin analogy with salt but i also agree that you know the the 99s the new ones they have more more base than i think is is, is appropriate right so they know all about that right it's that's no secret and they are still the most like they take it as constructive right um and that's really all you could ask um so yeah i have nothing but good things to say about the people behind meze let's keep going um Saturday night tacos were the best part of Can Jam. <laughs> Media, hanging out with you was the best part of Can Jam. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Saturday night tacos, definitely, definitely was my favorite. Yeah, that that your guys' event Saturday night was awesome. That was so much fun. I remember I was sitting there. Okay, this is gonna sound this is gonna sound dumb, but like I was sitting there like at a table with Crin and Flux and Zeos <laughs> and. Uh, I can't remember exactly how or why this happened, but I remember like Zeus got up to get himself a drink and I, I was like, hey, grab me a White Claw. And he pulled out a White Claw. Or maybe it was, I can't remember. Yeah, maybe it was me who did it. But like, yeah, the White Claw was like one that was fully sealed, but it was only like, it was only like half full or like a quarter of the way full. So we had like the, you know, the unicorn White Claw. <laughs> but yeah, that just that environment was, was awesome. Um... Spicy take cables matter, especially when you plug your headphones directly into two-channel speaker amplifier terminals. And it's not I can't verify that. <laughs> I I don't do that. I don't get into that stuff. Uh, most headphones are trash. IMs are better. Disagree. I think there's an argument for some IMs being better. Certainly the the um, these days with some of the stuff that's coming out, you know, at low price tags, it's it's incredible. Um, but one of the benefits of headphones is that it takes more of your ear anatomy into consideration. Like it actually, like more of you impacts the incoming sound. Um, so it's actually easier with headphones to get better sound than it is with IEMs because with IEMs you have to, things need to be more individualized, if that makes sense. Because the, as Corinna said, the ma manufacturers need to assume more about the individual's anatomy. Spicy take. Why Crin so arrogant not listening to anything at Can Jam after flying half around the world? No, I get it. I understand why. When you're at those events and you're doing media coverage, it's very difficult to actually... Because if you're there for a purpose, right? It's very difficult to spend time, right? Sitting and and really doing an evaluation. Like, I, we try. We do as much as we can. But, like, yeah, I, I... I would, you know... If you're there to do a job, that's different from if you're there as, you know, somebody... As, as a hobbyist now you might say like you know his job is to listen to stuff but i think he would rather go there build relationships for with with companies to send him stuff to spend more to, to do you know a better you know uh environment kind of listening session to be able to come up with a judgment and i respect that i'm nothing against that all right spicy take flathead earbud flathead earbuds can be pretty amazing when done right I feel like yeah, I, I yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, there there were some of, like a, a long time ago. I think that were good. I don't know of any current ones. Um, spicy take. Fr graphs shouldn't be smoothed. Um, 
like they're not what do you uh, do you mean like like they should be smoothed to like 124th or 112th but they shouldn't be smoothed further than that like the reason for that is is like you can yeah i mean there is a reason to smooth to a certain degree for readability so you can actually read where the peaks and dips are right i feel like that's important but like yeah i agree you shouldn't smooth it to the, the target you shouldn't smooth it to the same degree as the target Super. I think us squigglers, thank you, uh, could make Harmon Research obsolete with about two months of dev work. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know about obsolete. I think that, that there's a that body of research is super important um, for this for this hobby. Um, but uh, yeah, so given what Crin's coming out with soon, I don't want to spoil too much of it, but like it could actually do a lot to demonstrate to the world that people don't actually like Harmon IE 2019. <laughs> um, you know. And I actually, I think it's, it's so fundamental that like, I would almost want to like, like look through that research again and try and figure out where they may have gone wrong with the starting point. Um, I'm not sure, like, if Sean wa Sean's watching the stream, you might have something to say about this. But, like, it's the kind of thing where, like, I listen to stuff that is Harmon, I, like, perfectly matches Harmon, I, even EQ to ma perfectly match Harmon, i.e. 2019. It's the most wrong-sounding thing. Like, I can't, I can't make sense of it. Like, how did people actually like that? I, I, it's, it's bizarre to me. Um, so some, to me, something is not quite right there with the, with the in-ear research. The over-ear stuff is great. I don't have any issues there. And maybe it's what, what I was just saying about how manufacturers need to assume more uh, about the individual's anatomy because of the HRTF variation. Uh, maybe that's, that's something that can't be assumed in a highly smooth study like that to the degree that it needs to be. I don't know. Um, but I'm not, I'm not, I know I'm not alone in this. And we, what we were testing at the show, those of you who were at the show and tried this, you probably know, um, it, it was revealing. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, and the cool thing about this is that we can, we can do this testing. Um, I want to do it in some sort of like research format, right? I want to like put this to the test to say, Hey, is Harmon 2019, IE, IEM 2019, um, is that actually preferred in practice by people? Because um, we can we can fairly inexpensively, uh, yeah, we can cheaply do re do the research on this um, with a statistically significant panel now. And uh, so, f thanks to Crin for that. <laughs> um, let's keep going. Measure beta reviewers are poison. <laughs> I don't know. I I think it's up to us to take that stuff with a grain of salt. That's that's what I would say there, right? Or to like understand. Un uh, that's really that's really what it is. I think it's like you know. People treat it as a blunt instrument, and they 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 miss the nuance that's that's required there. Uh, or they 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 treat they treat it you know as a obvious indicator when it's when it's not um i eq og focals all day default tuning is still the best and great <laughs> uh steal terran's dx320 i don't think i can steal anything of terran's <laughs> all right If you, if you love your music, you should be able to enjoy it on anything. Yeah, but if you really love your music, you should try and make it sound as best as it can. As best as it can? As good as it can. Spicy take, your EQ settings matter more than your amp or DAC, and in some cases more than your headphones. EQ is free. Draw your own conclusions on value. I mean, that's, that's what I think. But I mean... 
we're rolling the ball uphill. Well, okay, I shouldn't say that. I, it's encouraging that actually the young, like the newer people coming into this hobby, who are also like searching for value. I think that that's kind of where they're starting to approach this from, and and I think that that is actually a good way to get into it because you don't need to spend tons of money, right? You just need a headphone that is reasonable, ideally, and then yeah, like dot get in, learn how to EQ. We have a video on that on how to do it, and it's not hard. And it's amazing how much you can improve the sound quality. The Harmon Curve was developed by asking Beats users what they like the most. <laughs> You're talking about like the uh, the the 2018 over ear ones where they included the untrained listeners. Um, there's an element of that. There's an element of you know including the unwashed masses gives you a result that is perhaps more not as refined as it would otherwise be for people who take this stuff seriously. Um, but here's where I'm going to also recommend you read the segmentation paper because there, there's a there are two other very important clusters to consider, and you know we have to remember that we are not the general audience. We're we're in the niche, right? So maybe you know within the niche we fall closer to one of the other clusters. But of course, I also know people who are like, yeah, like Harmon has nowhere near enough bass. <laughs> Specifically, Terran. <laughs> Seems like many weren't that blown away by the new Utopia twenty twenty two because it's basically the same. <laughs> like, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, they're using. It's it's the same, just slightly less in slightly toned down in the treble, and if the treble was make or break for people on that one, like if it specifically break if they found it to be too much, which I never did, but some people found it that way then this new one is exactly what they'd be looking for. So, regardless of how slammy dynamics are, planar bass has a different type of slam. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I get what you mean, yeah. Uh, Hyphen Man and Odyssey, um, that I prefer over dynamic drivers. I get what you mean. Um, yeah, this is why I don't really care that much about the whole slam question, right? Like, to me, music, the way I listen to music and what I listen to, it's that's like the most brutish element of the sound quality <laughs> it's important but i i only think it's important when you're dealing with the absence of that to a degree that makes things sound compressed and just you know bad pillowy um i rob you bought the obrava cupid but i've never i have never heard that Um, Resolve Utopia has peaky treble, HD 100, multiple large treble peaks, Zvar rings, choppy FR you know, for mids, and treble. Uh, yeah, see, this is the problem: is that is that you know, this statement is is a perfect demonstration of people not understanding how t headphone frequency response measurements should be read. You have to understand that the target is smooth to one half, right? We don't know what the fine grained result should be for you, for any individual. Right, and the fact that those headphones have, have, um, you, you don't think of it as uh, like peaks. Yeah, obviously we want smoothness, right? Let's say smoothness is desirable, but every headphone that has some sort of like you know wibbles, let's call it in the treble, that's not necessarily a bad thing because we could just think of those as being like HRTF -E in HRTF interactive, right? Like they're going to interact with people's uh, anatomy differently, and the fact that they have that behavior on the rig or with that particular ear doesn't mean that that's going to be the way that it is on your particular head, right? And that's not to say that those peaks don't exist. They do, but what they sound like is going to be different. Like the HT100S, yeah, there's a 6K peak. On the Utopia, there's a 6K and an 8K, and then, like, it's like the, 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 the harmonics, they're balanced, but that whole harmonic range is a little boosted, right? That's going to have a unique HRTF interaction, and we should not think... We don't want that region to be smooth to one half like if you smooth that to the same degree as the target it would look smooth like it would, those peaks wouldn't exist so the problem is we don't know what that should be right so when you're when you're when you're talking about it like this right here's the other thing have you listened to those headphones have you listened to this as far have you listened to the hd 100 maybe maybe i'm not saying you haven't but the point is more that like if you're listening to those headphones you know try and figure out 
okay, what am I actually hearing here? And how do I square that with what I'm seeing on the graph? Maybe you do hear those peaks, but do you hear them in the exact places that they show up on the graph? I would, I would argue you, you almost certainly don't, right? So the point is more that, or maybe you don't hear them to the same degree, or maybe you hear them worse, right? You need to know this about how, about the relationship between your actual anatomy and the measurement on the rig and that they are not a perfect one-to-one -one result, right? You can, you can identify things that you know are going to sound wrong, but if you look at the zoomed out analysis of a headphones frequency response that has, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, wibbles and deviations in the treble, as long as they're not extreme, as long as the, the harmonic balance is even and it has a general shape to it that is desirable, right, for DFHRTF or, you know, preference adjusted, um, it's, it's going to be fine. Um, you know, you say Cesvara rings choppy FR for the mids and treble. Um, okay. Like, if you listen to that headphone, does it sound choppy? Not to me. Um, because again, that's, that's the behavior on a measurement rig. It's not the behavior at your eardrum necessarily. Okay. That's the thing people need to know. Why not buy a Genelec if you're spending more than 5k on headphones? Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to get more into speakers, to be honest. Um, I missed one here. Sennheiser PC360 was the best gaming headset, and so ahead of its time. I, I, it's, I've heard that headphone, but it's been a while, man. Um, Harman Bass is uneven and comes off as shouty. How is Bass shouty? I feel like shout is specifically the relationship between lower or upper mids and treble, like 3k to 5k. Well, 3k mostly. Look at 2.2.5 to 5k. That's that's where that balance um, affects shout. Um, Harmon treble is terrible. No air above 10k. Yet another example. All right, let's take a look. I'm not, I'm not you know, saying this to single people out here. I, I'm, I'm sorry if that's how that comes across, but I don't mean it to. Um, the rigs, so let's look at this, 10K, right? The rigs um, are rated for accuracy up to about, well, I think, I think depending, I'm not sure exactly which one in 2013, but I believe like if you, if you, if you, a general statement of the rigs accuracy being up to, up to 10K, um, we could, we should probably chop off everything above that from the target. Um, and uh, so I think we could basically say everything from the t for the target above 10K is is either a measurement artifact or it's just a function of, of uh, you know, the specific rig that's being used smooth to that degree. Um, on, on actual, and again, this is not an actual human. <laughs> I'm so excited for when, for when we do research on the 5128. Um, but when you're reading the graphs, the point is that you should not consider, you should not take Harmon treble into consideration above 10 K. So, I mean, I, if, if people do that, I agree with you. The Harmon treble is terrible. <laughs> But they shouldn't, and I think actually I can't remember who who represents it with ten the stuff above ten k lopped off. I can't remember who it is. Maybe it's oratory, or it's like it's like faded somehow. Um, Jeff, I appreciate that. <laughs> Please don't get jaded by this community. It's it's a struggle, man. <laughs> A spicy take Harmon curve is perfect if you don't like the sound the problem is how the music is mixed read the segmentation paper my dude read the segmentation paper read the rest of the research please if you think it's perfect because it might be perfect it might be preferred by the general audience but that doesn't mean it's going to necessarily be preferred by you spicy take the HD6 or, or you know individual people right the HD 600 sounds 150% better than the Meze 109. 150%. For one third the price and the comfort at 290 grams ain't bad either. But people always want something new. Yeah, I mean, 
there's an element of people always wanting something new. I think for me, the comfort on these is better because the clamp is not as intense. And I find even, yeah, I know you can stretch them out. Even still, I found them a bit clampy on the 600s. Um, the sound stage is better on these, like no question. Um, but there is there is definitely advantage of the six 600. I think it is smoother in the treble, you know, it's more neutral. Um, doesn't have as good bass extension though, right? So it's like trade-offs, right? Um, most people, like I'm not talking specifically audiophiles looking for one one thing or another, or like, you know, specifically soundstage. I think for the average person out there, yeah, I think the HD 600 would probably be preferred. The sound of it would probably be preferred. But the ergonomics, I think this would be preferred. I don't know. Uh, is Focal ripping off customers with Utopia 22 by asking 1K more? Can't you achieve the same change with EQ? So you can achieve the same with EQ. You should remember that people aren't going to do that. The other thing is um, I don't really care about the price increase, the extra 1K, because they weren't able to... Well, for starters, it is it is the price difference that inflation has jumped uh, or has caused basically uh, from uh, 2016 to now. Um, actually, I think it's even less than that, but it's ballpark. Um, and um, so there's that. But the second arg the second thing I'm going to say there is that like um, you 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 def if you own an original Utopia, my, I'm always going to tell you if you, if the treble is too spicy, then just EQ it, right? Uh, and I would not recommend existing owners go out and buy a 2022 utopia because they're so similar for the sound quality unless there's other reasons why you would want to do that um like for example the the you'd like the way that it looks or something like that but here's here's the other thing people are are concerned about the 1k price increase these are already th those were already like four thousand or forty four hundred dollar headphones which is already absurdly expensive for headphones <laughs> so you know the people who were worried about that you know i i, I don't know why the the conversation is is that uh, you know oh yeah extra 1k like you know that's 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 outrageous it's like no 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 that that's not what's outrageous what's outrageous is that these that, that headphones at all cost four thousand dollars all right um so i'm going to um so when it comes to that kind of stuff like i'm going to say the same thing that my boss said a long time ago which is that is at no point w would you recommend that any human spend four thousand dollars or five thousand dollars on a pair of headphones but if somebody has five thousand dollars to spend on a pair of headphones right yeah absolutely look at those you have to remember like that's that i i i'm not a fan of you know exorbitant price tags for this stuff either but like you have to remember that that it's not about it's not about anything other than what people are willing to pay and if people are willing to pay that that's fine that's that's what it costs <laughs> The market decides this stuff. Spicy take. What if you came out with a cheap headphone and an EQ preset tuning so people could find common baseline to find what they like? Maybe you think you like neutral, but you really don't. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. I, I, I like that idea. Um, I also think that there's a difference between, I mean, yeah, Sean disagrees with this and it's fair. Um, I, I do think there's a difference between people who when it comes to what people like they don't they don't necessarily think they like neutral or they don't necessarily think that what they like is neutral um, and as an example right the people who crank up the bass in their like the absurd bass subwoofers in their cars right they don't think that that's neutral but they still like it that's still their preference um so, um, yeah, I, 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 I think that that idea of like, I also think you'd probably get a different result in the research if you ask people, you know, hey, do you think this is neutral versus, you know, do you prefer this? Do you like this? You know, which one do you like better? Right. Um, I think you'd, you'd maybe get a different answer. And I don't necessarily think it's a better answer. Right. I don't think the research would be better for it because I, in because you have that then confounding variable of like what the general public thinks is neutral and that can be influenced and skewed in all kinds of ways like people think the bare dynamic headphones are neutral it's like no like sure use them as tools in studios that's fine but that's not 
that's not neutral, right? Like, or I, I guess like, yeah, I mean, what is neutral, right? I suppose that's a difficult thing, but people have that idea that that's neutral. Um, and, you know, maybe that would then influence the research. And I don't, I don't necessarily think for the better, but it is worth, I think it's worth asking that question so that you can see if they match. All right, let's, let's keep going here. Uh, wow, there's a lot of, okay. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, we'll go for another, yeah, another 15, 20 minutes here. We'll see. We'll go until I get tired. <laughs> um, yeah, who cares if something is fun or versus accurate? I'd like people, I, w one of my close friends, actually, he's, he, he's specifically into V-shaped sounding headphones, right? And we were all here chasing neutrality, right? Like, what is an even total balance? What's neutral, right? We're looking at harm and stuff. It's like, okay, that must be good. But like, he's like, yeah, I, I don't want it to sound neutral. I want, I want it. I want bass and treble. That's all I want. <laughs> it's like, all right, that's who cares? You know, <laughs> people like what they like, and they should be free to like whatever they like. I might think that that stuff isn't great sounding, but who cares, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, you've tried the HD 100 Hi-Fi Mans uh, to know all these issues you see on the graph were all audible to me, just interpreted in a certain way. Yeah, but here's what I here's what I would say is I, I bet you would have a different impression if you listen to the headphones before looking at the graph. Um give you a headache oh, that's not good another thing to consider with treble peaks we view frequency response graphs with a log scale in the treble region a narrow peak is actually a range wider than the entire base region oh as far as like like wait wait but we, we view it in a log scale because that's kind of how we hear them though at least that's what i've been told um but I get what you're saying. Yeah, like the the actual frequency ranges are wider. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the log scale is there for a reason. Uh... Let's see. <laughs> reflective add-ons what the hell is that now this is why i was saying on twitter recently like it's like there's there's certain headphones that get me that, that get me right in the hrtfs it was a joke but it, there, there's there's truth to that right where like there are certain there are certain headphones that where the frequency response is less smoothed, or like it's it's less smooth than the treble. Like actually, here's here's an interesting one: the HD six hundred. The frequency response of the HD six hundred is actually not smooth in the treble, yet it sounds smooth. Why is that? Right? It's because the target is highly smoothed, and there there is we want there to be some sort of you know uh, something that that matches our HRTF ideally, uh, or get, or is close to that in some way. Um, that's that's idea and we and not equal loudness guys equal loudness is not good um and you can test this yourself using you don't need equipment to do this you can test this yourself using equalizer apo you can eq something to be perfectly equal loudness across the board in the treble it will sound wrong i promise you it'll sound wrong <laughs> um because certain 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 sounds are meant to sound like certain frequencies are meant to be heard a little bit louder than others uh, because that's the way things in real life come across um, but, uh, yeah, from, from a broad, broad zoomed out kind of like uh, view, you don't want major, you know, elevations and dips and things like that. Right. But even, even the, the HG 600, 
it's not perfectly smooth in the trouble. And you can test this by running a cursor-based sweep in Roo. Um, so if anybody doubts that, you should try that. <laughs> You think Sean should give uh, Resolve, Crin, and Super access to their research facilities? Hell yeah, dude. That'd be so awesome. <laughs> Which sounds better to you, Tiger 300R or DT900 Pro X? Tiger 300R. DT900 Pro X is dull and blunted not, and smeary. It's not great. Good base extension, though. Um... Let's see. Yeah, I wasn't that into the TRX zero zeros, uh, the ebony ones. I'm not sure about the. People say the EMUT is supposed to be really good. I'm curious about that. Oh, Harmon comes off comes off with shoddy too, not the base. Could be. I think. Shout again is is not about ear gain level so much as it's between it's about relationship between upper mids and treble. So like I find the MM500 and the LCD5 to be shouty, um, and that's not because of the level of 3K. It's because of the relationship between 3K and the rest of the treble. So the 3K harmonics are emphasized over the harmonics above it, right? Air equals harmonic distortion caused by high frequency reflection. Mm, what? <laughs> it, no, like I when people well maybe some people refer to it like that, but when when I think when people are describing it in this case, they're talking about frequency like just just try this like with EQ APO. Frequencies above 10k. The frequencies like specifically 12k and above are 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 what people refer to as air. Right? The if there's more there, it sounds more airy. If there's less there, it sounds less airy, right? It's sort of a correlation with a sense of openness and trouble extension generally. Real life has no air. <laughs> yeah, but that's just a frequency response thing. I don't think it's harmonic distortion. I don't know what you're talking about there. Oh, we got more spicy takes. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Sorry, I gotta, I gotta get down to these ones here. Um. Helios, harmonic? No, you mean the Symphonium Helios. I think we covered it. Um, it's quite good, but it's the fit is a bit unique. I'm really excited for people to more people to try that Meteor. I tried the Meteor at CanJam, and it was very good. Um, that might be the IEM to get at 500 or whatever it's at 600. I'm not sure. Um, it and, but it was also smaller for the shell than the Helios, so it actually fit me a bit better. Um, so that's that was great. Um, yeah, I'm very curious to to try that one uh, in, in you know in my home environment at some point. I think I'll maybe we'll do a video on that one because like that one is um, it might be. I still think it's like that's what I would get probably for something that is like it had maybe just a little bit much upper trouble for me, but like everything else was like really dialed in, and I'd have to compare that against the SA6 to see which one I prefer there. But but the, it did not have too much ear gain, which was great. <laughs> Metal 571 be a great part time infrequent addition to the headphone show crew. Yes. Is the material on the outside of the DC expanse squishy? Ooh, kind of. Not squishy, no, but like, kind of like. It's hard to describe. It's really cool. Like, that. It looks weird in pictures, but in person it looks better. Um, yeah, I like the look of it. Um. Uh, Ego Death featuring Steve Vai came out 28th. Just a spicy song. Okay, well, I'll check that one out. I'm always, yeah, into... I'm recently into getting into Snarky Puppy uh, more. I, I've, I listened to them a long time ago, but I've gotten back into them because they released some new stuff. Their new song, Trinity, is, is an absolute banger. It's awesome. Yeah, Meteor versus the SA6. That's the one... That's what I need to compare because it's... Uh, SA6 is one of my favorites in that... It's, the, it's what I would buy at that price point right now, but because I, I like that kind of relaxed, kind of warmer sound for IEMs. Um, 
just really nice unfatiguing and meteor is a little brighter it's it's definitely got more upper treble zing to it but maybe that's like the counterpoint to the to the sa6 that i'm after and again the oracle the oracle original oracle is is what i consider my neutral reference point still um and the mark ii is kind of neutral bright for me it's how i describe that i don't know actually if super's still in here let me know what you what you thought of the oracle mark ii hey phil's in here what's up phil Phil, are you still are you still selling the Phil phone? I was gonna tell people if they want Slam to buy that. <laughs> that was one of the ones we were comparing against the HE6 and the Slam stack. Are you got oh uh, Real Audio Reviews asks, are you guys going to stock the Meteorite Symphonium? Meteor? I actually have no idea. I, I So when I went to Can Jam, the day that we were there setting up, our booth was right next to um, the Symphonium guys. And they uh, they were just like, hey, do uh, you want to check out uh, the new one that we're releasing tonight and just bring it back to the booth tomorrow? And so I, I that night I went, I was doing some work and I, listen, I was listening to those that night, basically. So that's the the only time that I have with it. And then I brought it back down. I was like, yeah, this is dope. But um, I have no idea what the, if Taryn has a plan for that. Um, have you heard the Elysian Annihilator? No, I'd, I'd love to listen to it. Um, the, the the other so I listened to the Supermoon that was quite technical. I also listened to the other um, one of the unique melodies was was very impressive for technical performance. Um, one of them was less so, and one of them was very very good. Um, I don't remember the names. <laughs> Oh, still no storefront, eh? For for yours, okay. All right. Um, yeah, Phil Phone was was very. It's it's his his. Was it like an Audio Technica chassis? I think. Um, yeah. For people who want that V-shaped kind of thing, or like I don't know what what I'd call it, like, slammy. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> next time. Uh, what's the best way to EQ according to your HRTF? So, so here, actually, this is interesting. So, why ha why isn't having all frequencies equal a good method? All right, um, the, I mean, I've talked about this at like a, a length in the past, but basically, it's like there are sounds that you naturally hear that are meant to have certain elements of those sounds louder and certain elements quieter, and if you if they are not louder or quieter. Um, it the whole thing will sound wrong. Um, like a good example of this is the S's, F's, and T's. Um, if you go equal loudness above 5K, like for like if you smooth everything out by ear, um, well, you could do it on the graph too, but but you need to do it with your own ear because you don't know what the actual interactions are going to be like on your head um, with your and you know your own HRTF as well. So like you you need to do this by ear, um, but it's very easy to do. Like anybody can do this. Um, if you do that, the S's, F's, and T's, they sound completely imprecise. Like they are not pinpoint. They are just this sort of like smeary, fuzzy kind of sound. Like it sounds like a S sounds become becomes almost like a sh sound. It's it's not quite to that degree, but you get the idea, right? Like the whole thing sounds very smoothed over and wrong. Um, and uh, but anyways, back to the your earlier. Uh, uh, question there about the best ways to EQ according to your HRTF. This is interesting because um, we don't know that HRTF matching is necessarily going to be preferred by people. And I think this is also, well, okay. Sean seems to think that the reason why the smoothing of the target to one half is okay because um, because the position, as you change the position of the sound, um, you know, your the the features the HRTF features in the trouble kind of smooth out as well, um, but the, the the counter argument to that uh, I think is that the same is true for the features below five K, and we don't we don't get rid of those; those are still there, right? Um, and and they are going to change depending on the position as well. So, um, so we might as well. I think we might as well, we should use both. That's my thought. We, we should use a fine grain result and also a smooth result. But I don't, 
In fact, I know that people are not... When they look at a graph, they're not necessarily taking any of that into consideration. Um, they're not taking the smoothness versus the fine grain, you know, result into consideration. And they're not considering what the difference would be when coupled to the side of their own head and where, how things would shift. Um, but anyways, the point being that we don't know that HRTF matching is necessarily going to be preferred by people. And this is one of the things that I think is actually important from the Harmon research is that they, if they just ask people what they preferred, you have these preference filters, basically, um, like a tilt or a slope. Um, and um, what, what, what I wanted was a more fine-grained result so that you could at least have a sense of what like a median ear, HR, a median HRTF tilted that way would look like. Um, so that you could try it right and maybe you would find that actually it's not the right one for you and you'd have to kind of adjust it for your own and then see if that's desirable but i imagine you would get closer than what you have with the one half smoothed uh, result um so but anyways point being we don't know that hrtf matching is necessarily better but it's it's probably the first place that i would look to try and see if if some of the, the some of the technical benefits of a utopia for example are replicatable in other headphones or you know in hd 100s for example um and um and uh in order to eq to that i yeah i've no you'd actually have to figure out what your hrtf is and i can't help you there um supposedly there are ways of doing that i i know that um blaine uh the guy i work with uh is has worked on that in the past but yeah uh, that's a, it's a tough question. I think what you have to do is try and make sure, like if I were to do this, I would like when I'm dialing in my EQ. Yeah, I use the graph to a certain extent, and then at 5K, I start doing a more heuristic approach. So I'll I'll try and go, you know, uh, I'll try and and smooth things out to a reasonable degree if they are like super out of whack. Um, but I know, for example, that I from my ear canal, I have a resonance at around 6.1K. And this is one that I don't completely flatten on, on headphones. I just, I often leave it there. Um, and, and again, if you try this, you'll know what I mean. Um, but but the point is more that, you know, that's one way, one thing that I, I know just from sweeping on headphones that measure perfectly flat. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just sweep that region and they're still elevated there. They're still forward there. Um, Abby, thank you. For warm organic sound, what's your take on the Advar? Advar is kind of bright, actually. So, well, especially in the upper treble, it's detailed, but it is it is it's a bit bright. Yeah. For if you're looking for a warm organic sound, go SA6. That's the, that is the way. Um, are we gonna roll up Canjam New York? Maybe. AirPods Pro Two is good. Oh yeah, we have we have them. We have them. <laughs> Wait, I I there's one that I'm gonna do a bit. Well. I'll, I think actually the guys are doing a video that's coming out soon, either tomorrow or soon. Uh, and then uh, we might do like a round table discussion after I've had a chance to listen to them as well. But I'm very excited about that. I'm not an Apple user, but I've, I've, I've loved the AirPods, the, the originals, so I'm excited for this one. How is the ZMF Caldera? Yeah, it's very interesting. I, 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 I'm, yeah, fascinated by that stuff. Um, yeah. S is peaks around seven and eleven k. Well, it's that whole range. It's like it's relationships for harmonics above between five k and ten k usually, um, and making sure that that range is the right balance for the harmonics, the way that, that you actually hear them in real life is the key. And that is going to be, it's going to vary depending on the person. It's going to vary depending on the position. Um, and that's why all of these things, like you cannot, you can't interpret a graph to be able to perfectly know that that's going to, it's going to be right for you. And that's why you can't, like the graph is not a substitute for actually listening to the headphone. And actually, we're going to demonstrate, like, okay, so right now I use a measurement rig that is basically two 43 AGs on an upright fixture to basically, you know, replicate a 45 CA. Um, but um, 
we're eventually going to be uh, getting a- additional ear simulators in um, and we'll demonstrate the differences like the, the interaction like the, the HRTF differences basically um, to, that show up depending on the ear and part of the goal there is to kind of help explain to people like or to, 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 to help with I guess the, the public knowledge and understanding about how frequency response actually works with and the relationship with ears um like here's here's like another way to think about it right um if you not everybody has the same shape of foot all right don't don't get too excited here (laughs) for the people who get excited about that kind of stuff but think about the shape of a foot right um there's the there's the arch of the foot right and everybody has a different shape to that arch uh, or a different maybe degree of arch. some people need more arch support some people need people need less but at the very least people need something that is generally foot shaped for a shoe to be comfortable and then you can figure out what the best what the optimal one is for you um and so the same way it's like you know you need like things need to be generally ear gain shaped for it to be well received but that doesn't necessarily mean that one ear gain shape is the right one for everyone and certainly like the the what we see on the measurement rig on the graph that is as it relates to one particular ear um like one well, like an ear simulator even right but like uh, you get what i mean right like it's one particular shape and that might be different depending on the for it might be you know more appropriate or less appropriate you, some people might want more some people want less and just think about what that means, like that parallel with like arch support. If you've ever worn a shoe where there's too much arch, arch support, it's, it's painful. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it hurts, right? If you've ever worn a shoe with not enough, it's, it feels wrong. And the same thing is true for, for, for sound. Um, you need to approach these graphs with that in mind, I think. Anyways, guys, we've been we've gone for over two hours, so uh, I'm gonna cut it there. Thanks to everybody for hanging out. As usual, stay tuned to the headphones community forum for uh, the advanced notice of graph information and all the data and stuff like that. Now, links to that in the description and um, uh, the uh, guides, reviews, and article section up on headphones.com where we actually publish the articles. Thanks to all the regulars for hanging out. And if this is your first time watching one of my live stream Q and A's or rants about various subjects, (laughs) um, or, uh, and if you're new to this channel in general, uh, definitely uh, give us a like comment and subscribe if you so choose. Uh, Otherwise uh, I'm gonna say uh, have a good weekend to everybody and I'll see you guys probably next week sometime.